almost sneaking up to that, but um, you know, the efforts of SpaceX, of Elon, mm. maybe in general, what your thoughts are about those efforts. So you already mentioned Starship will be very interesting for astronomy, for, for science in general, just getting stuff out into space. But what about the longer term goal of actually colonizing, of building civilizations on other surfaces, on moons, on planets? It seems like an, a fairly obvious thing to do for our survival, right? There's a high risk if, if we are committed to trying to keep this human, human experiment going, um, putting all of our eggs in one basket is always going to be a risky strategy to pursue. It's a nice basket though, but it, yeah. It is a beautiful basket. I wouldn't want to, I personally have no interest in living on Mars or the moon. Yeah. I would like to visit, but I would definitely not want to spend the rest of my life and die on Mars. It's a, it means a hellhole. Mars is a very, very different, I think the idea that this is going to happen in the next, you know, 10, 20 years is, seems to me very optimistic. Um, not that it's insurmountable, but the the challenges are extreme to survive on a planet like Mars, which is you know like a dry, frozen desert um, with a high radiation environment. It's it, it's a challenge of, of a type we've never faced before. So it, it's I'm sure human ingenuity can tackle it, but I'm skeptical that we'll have thousands of people living on Mars in my lifetime. But I would I would relish that opportunity to maybe one day visit such a settlement and you know. Um, do scientific experiments on Mars or experience Mars, uh, do astronomy from Mars, you know, all sorts of cool stuff you could do. Um, you know, sometimes you see these dreams of outer solar system exploration and you can like fly through the clouds of Venus or you could um, just do these enormous jumps on like these small moons where you can essentially jump as high as a skyscraper and traverse the moon. So there's all sorts of, you know, wonderful ice skating on Europa might be fun. So don't get me wrong, I love the idea of us becoming interplanetary. I think it's um, it's just a question of uh, time. Our own, our own destructive tendencies are, as you said earlier, are at odds with our emerging capability to become interplanetary. And the question is, will we get out of the nest before we burn it down? Mm. And I, I don't know. I, obviously, I hope that we do, but I, I don't have any special insight that there, there is a problem. There is somewhat of a, um, a gnawing intellectual itch I have with the, the so-called doomsday argument, which um, I try not to treat too seriously, but there is some element of it that bothers me. Uh, the doomsday argument basically suggests that you know, you're typically the mediocrity principle, you're not special, that you're probably going to be born somewhere in the middle of all human beings who will ever be born. You're unlikely to be one of the first 1% of human beings that ever lived and one of the last 1%, and similarly the last 1% of human beings that will ever live, because you'd be very unique and special if that were true. And so by this logic, you can sort of calculate um, how many generations of humans you might expect. So if there's been, let's say, 100 billion human beings that have ever lived on this planet, then you could say to 95% confidence, so uh, you divide by 5%, so uh, 100 billion divided by 0.05 would give you 2 trillion human beings that would ever live you'd expect by this argument. And so if each, um, if let's say each each planet, each, in general, the planet has a 10 billion population. So that would be 200 generations of humans we would expect ahead of us. And if each one has an average lifetime of say 100 years, then that would be about 20,000 years. So there's 20,000 years left on the clock. There's mm -hmm. like a typical doomsday argument type. Uh, that's how they typically lay it out. Um, now you can, argue the, a lot of the criticisms of the doomsday argument come down to, well, what are you really counting? You're counting humans there, but maybe you should be counting years. Or maybe you should be counting human hours. You know, how, what are you? Because what you count makes a big difference to what you get out in the other end. So this is called the reference class, um, and so that's one of the big criticisms of the doomsday argument. But I do think it has a compelling point that it would be surprising if our future is to one day blossom and become a galactic spanning empire. Trillions upon trillions upon trillions of human beings will one day live across the stars for essentially as long as the galaxy exists and the stars burn. We would live at an incredibly special point in that story we would be right at the very, very, very beginning. And that's not impossible, but it's just somewhat improbable. And so there's part of that sort of um, irks against me, but it also almost feels like a philosophical argument because you're sort of talking about souls being drawn from this cosmic pool. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not an argument that I lose sleep about for our fate of the doomsday, but it is um, somewhat intellectually annoying that, that there is a, a slight contradiction there, it feels like, with the idea of a galactic spanning empire. And but of course, there's so many unknowns. I, I, for one, would love to visit even space, but Mars. Just imagine standing on Mars and looking back at Earth. Yeah, I mean, um, the incredible sight. It would give you such a fresh perspective as to your entire existence and what it yeah. to be human. Yeah, and then come back to Earth. And it would it would give you it'd give you a heck of a perspective. Plus, the the sunset on Mars is supposed to be nice. I loved what William Shatner said after his flight. Um, his words really moved me when he came down. And I think uh, it, it really captured the idea that we shouldn't really be sending uh, engineers, our scientists into space. We, we should be sending our poets because those are the people when they come down who can 
who can truly make a difference with when they describe their experiences in space. And I found it very moving reading what he what he said. <laughs> yeah, it, you, when you talk to astronauts, when they when they describe what they see, it's like this, <laughs> like they discovered a whole new thing that they can't possibly convert back into words. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's beautiful to see.